So you did mention uh, my two previous novels. Uh, my current one was out uh, the summer of 2014. That is known to be uh, the, the, the summer of the Gaza war. And uh, it was three years ago. Um, in the first year and a half of the book's publication, I received a huge embrace from the Israeli readership, I got awarded, I got reviewed, I got whatever, uh, um, a wonder kid of literature that has vanished away from the literary of arena uh, and returns after 15 years of absence, receives. And I got very much pleased. And I thought, that's it. I should start writing a new one. And then came the last day of December 2015. And that was the day uh, it was published that the committee of the curriculum, literature cu curriculum in the Ministry of Education has decided to exclude my novel from uh, what the young readers in Israel should be reading uh, in oblig obligatory uh, classes. And then I, I was... Uh, overwhelmed with a huge storm that was created in Israel because of the arguments, mainly because of the arguments that were stated in that report coming from the ministerial committee, nominated by the current so-called Minister of Education. Excuse me. <laughs> if I won't mention his name, not to, not to follow. <laughs> he has so much publicity due to his uh, steps against the freedom of speech in Israel. And he had added to this uh, uh, pile that is getting higher and higher uh, uh, the ban of my book from the curriculum. And it had created a huge steer of, of both his followers who were uh, following his uh, appearance on TV and the way he described me, my book, the reasons, the reasons for it not to be appropriate for kids to read, and the huge support I received from my own tribe. You know, it's a tribal time <laughs> everywhere, not only in Israel, not only in the Middle East. It's, it had, it had, this epidemic had uh, been proven to be in, uh, contagious, and, and you guys, uh, you suffer from this uh, epidemic as well. Um, yes, so my tribe, my, the liberal tribe, the peace tribe in Israel, those uh, Israelis who are supporting democracy and are really worried for the threat of the freedom of speech in Israel, were gathering about my, around my novel, and they were turning it from a literary work into a symbol. And I was finding myself in the midst of all this happening um, with, uh, <laughs> with a stutter, a stutter, yeah? Um, and with amazement of uh, how these, these waves are, are, are alienating me from the intimate work of one person sitting in the studies in his study for six years of writing, trying to uh, visualize his thoughts and transfer them into words. And it, it, it's very funny that, it, that we're here in the west side of Manhattan where many scenes of the book are happening. So the book is actually two thirds of it is set in Brooklyn and in west side Manhattan uh, downtown Manhattan, and, and, and for during those six years, I was actually walking, mentally walking around here and uh, experiencing the city from Hebrew with the power of Hebrew to restage those sights and voices and smells and the whole sensuous experience of walking around here. 
and being around here and meeting people and having this love story created in this background, in this vista. What maybe should be um, mentioned that my characters, they are an Israeli and a Palestinian and their love story is the cause for the reason to, to, to find it a threat to the, to the Jewish identity of the young readers as it was quoted in the report by the committee. Um, before maybe we could, could go through the, the scandal, let me just say that writing uh, about the winter in New York with the Hebrew Palais, I mean the palette of colors that we have in Hebrew is very elaborated when it comes to desert, to heat, to dust, to those colors of pale green and golden browns and yellows. But when you have to describe frost and snow and ice, when you have to have all this tremendous uh, bunch of metaphors around uh, what unbearable uh, 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 cold is, actually is, you, you have a very narrow vocabulary. And it, <laughs> we don't have so many words to describe these kinds of rains and those kinds of uh, mixture of snow and, and ice within the drops of, of, of We don't have it because we don't, you, you know, a language is a reflection of the, the, the landscapes that it's been evolved in. So um, I had to struggle with this poor um, repertoire of Hebrew for our winters, <laughs> who are very symbolic, almost, almost hypothetical, um, that to, to describe this harsh winter of New York in order to maybe project Khilmi and Liat, the, these two Mediterranean, Mediterranean Middle Easterns, uh, sense of exile and their home longing, homesickness for the sun above their childhood, about their adult life, and everything that they miss back, everything that they call motherland, is being uh, maybe uh, concentrated in this mother son that is uh, the one they miss the most. It's a good start to take it from here? Sure. Uh, you approve. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so Dorit, one of the, I think that from an American perspective, and uh, most, but uh, not everyone here I know is American, but uh, maybe half of you, I don't know. But from an American perspective, the issue of intermarriage, or to speak more generally, exogamy, the idea of having an intimate relationship with somebody outside your group, in this case, not a Jew, right? is, uh, I think, different for Americans versus Israelis. So Americans may read this book and hear the story and say, what? You know, what's the controversy? What's the problem? What's the issue? Not only He's with- an Arab. <laughs> right, no, I know. It's but a very intimidating case because he is an Arab. His Arabness is the reason for them to find the book inappropriate for young readers. Not, I don't think that if he was an Italian or French or Swede, it would have created such a resentment towards this love between them. I don't think that if Hilmi, the Palestinian, was described so fundamentally and so hum humanely, so generously, equally described as Liat, the Israeli, they wouldn't have found him to be a threat. Right. Uh, Liat herself in the book is terrified of her Israeli family and her Israeli friends of learning that she has this relationship with Hilmi, a Palestinian artist, you know, very, you know, loving, kind person. He's not involved, apparently, in any politics, you know. And so she, she herself, who is the do heroine... You see, do you see the afraid. irony? Yeah. Even, even the, I mean, because of the fact that I was looking into this subject of fear of getting involved with an outsider from the community, a non-Jew uh, partner for intimacy, even this looking, in, looking into this subject, trying to, to elaborate what is this fear all about, was the same reason for them to consider my book to be a threat to the Jewish 
identity of the kids. For them to consider it might encourage uh, intimate relationship between Jews and non-Jews. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, I, I, I cannot find it. I cannot stop, though, all these months, almost, almost 16 months have passed. I still, when I recall that it did happen, that it's not some strange dream that I dreamt, uh, I find it so ridiculous, so absurd, because of this same reason. Mm -hmm. um, well, in Israel, though it's true, correct me if I'm wrong, you know better than me, obviously, that relationships of this sort are extremely rare. Is that right? When the scandal was happening, I heard uh, later on, I heard a recording of a very popular radio show that they were going, OK, they banned the book because of this reason. So let's go to the Institute, Institute of Statistics in Israel and ask how many intermarriages are they? How many Jew, Jews and Arabs do get married, do, uh, you know, uh, take upon themselves this uh, destiny that is uh, challenging, that is complicated, and going and, and pass and, and breaking through this barrier of uh, religion difference. Uh, do you want to have a guess how many a year in the past 20 years? Official, official marriages of uh, Jews and non-Jews uh, in Israel. Thousands? Thousands? 18 a year. So 18 couples are breaking this command from, the, from ancient Jewish school of keeping within your community, not to mix with the surrounding environment, not to mix with the uh, a culture that you live among, not to get out of the ghetto walls of the Jewish existence and get involved with romantic relationship with a non-Jew. So they had done far beyond the beyond this by finding this book to be a threat. Because mm -hmm. this command is so integralized, I interla uh, internalized. internalized, thank you very much, internalized in our Zionist education, the concept of separation is, a, is, a, is an elaboration of the Jewish um, way of life in exile. In diaspora, Jews maintain their separate identity, their separate ways of life by reciting, by the ritual of separation. Is it dairy to milk? No, dairy to meat. And it, it is from sacred to secular. It's from the midweek to the, to the, to the, to the Shabbat. It's the, the, the Shabbat to the beginning of next week. All this havdalah, all this isolation, all this separation, all this concept of division, it all to do with the next gener generations to learn and maintain, not to get in integrated, not to cross this boundary. And, and we don't need uh, uh, um, and obey from the Ministry of Education not to do it because we are taught in so many official education manners and, and ways and those subcurrents, subliminal powers underneath the culture that educate us for this element. And you see, I'm, I'm concentrated on the Israeli issue. I don't cross it to, the, to your, uh, your, your, you guys' uh, um, confrontation with this issue. Because uh, I, I think that the curtain that is opened in the book is between those two Middle Easterns. The, the, the revelation is for them to see each other, to acknowledge each other, to, 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 to explore one another. America serves as a background. Right. So I have my own. You, uh, you, you, I mean, it just uh, not to uh, kind of trade uh, Arab Jewish romance stories, but I uh, <laughs> I once dated a, a Palestinian woman. Um, this was way back when uh, the Oz, just coincidentally, the Oslo Accords had just been announced, and so the, I went out and found a Palestinian to you know uh, have a relationship with. But no, actually, I I forget the sequence of events, but. It felt like it was not a big deal uh, to me, 
right? Because for American Jews, even if you're Jewish and you participate in Judaism, uh, you may not realize this. Of non-Orthodox Jews, about 80% of American Jews uh, intermarry um, in, in the younger cohort. Uh, in terms of in non-Jewish dating, I mean, I would say it's 100%. You know, but I think on her side, although it was not a serious relationship, it wasn't like the one in the book, uh, she was much more uncomfortable with it. And I, I got, you know, she never had me into her house. I never met her family, although she lived at home. And, and maybe that was why the relationship ended, or maybe she didn't like me. But, uh, but, but my point is this, that on the Arab side, wouldn't there be a great deal of discomfort um, and, and even condemnation of this relationship? And I was curious, because in the book, most of that discomfort comes from Liat's side, and there's almost none from Hilmi, and even his family uh, and friends don't like Israeli politics, uh, but they seem to have no issue about uh, a Jew in the midst. Is that Except for normal? with Sam, uh, his brother, who is so into politics, everything he sees is politics. He doesn't lay his eye on anything without seeing politics in it. I think it's also to do with Liat being the feminine, being the woman. And I think it's also to do with Hilmi being um, a non-Jew. I mean, the Islam is much more hospitalizing for newcomers. I, 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 we, we know it. We, you, can become, you can become a Muslim in an hour. And for, for uh, Liat, having this pounding DNA of two years of diaspora, as much as it sounds p pathetic, it does, the, this pulse does travel with her when she, um, when she, when she travels overseas. Actually, the name Gader Chaya, which means a living fence, it will have a very poetic uh, expression to describe a hedge, just a hedge. But in Hebrew, it sounds as if this fence has a life of its own. It's a portable one. It's one that can be carried on with you in your consciousness. It can become almost a barrier from her to see Hilmi as individual, but she crosses it, but yet there is the, the, vivid, the vivity of this fence within her, the one she was very much molded by the ideology of her, her educators, um, is eventually even more powerful and more demanding than her own will itself. It, it, she doesn't uh, only follows her heart, or she follows into it, it until one, some extent, and she she is very much withdrawn by those power powers. Mm -hmm. and, and to talk about politics for a second, must we? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we we're Israelis. We we're we're uh, we're political entities, one thing or not. Right. Um, yes, it's true. One, one thing that I think is brought out well in the book is how not only is this about like exogamy and, uh, you know, uh, just being with a different culture, it, it's about, it, it brings out how really these two groups are engaged in an ongoing war. And, you know, Liat encounters friends of Hilmi, one of whose father was killed by Israeli commandos, uh, you know, because he was a leader in the PLO. Hilmi himself describes how his family was uh, originally from Lida, which many people may know of from Ari Shavit's book. Uh, it's, it's a contentious issue in Israeli historiography, but the point is, is that um, uh, many, many Palestinians were removed from Lida and had to evacuate during the 1948 war. Lida, Lod Airport. So the, uh, uh, he also describes how he was uh, mistreated by Israeli soldiers while he was in jail um, on the West Bank. And we should mention, he is from the West Bank. He is not an Israeli Arab. He's a Palestinian West Bank Arab. They wouldn't have met it unless they, they had uh, come across each other in some checkpoint. Right. So, I, I mean, Liat and Hilmi couldn't have met unless they traveled overseas. Right. So to get to my question is, when you have such a long history of warfare between two peoples, and it's likely that each side will have grievances, of course, Israelis would have their own 
stories on their side, friends and relatives that they had lost in this war. Uh, is it really possible uh, for these types of relationships to, uh, to grow and flourish? I mean, how, how can people deal with that history? This is not a political question. <laughs> well, I guess it's, it, it's I was both. thinking, I what, wanted... what should I say uh, in the presence of uh, <laughs> our fellows <laughs> um, that, that would be um, uh, talking about uh, Netanyahu that wouldn't be causing another uh, scandal? Um, I think these two young Middle Easterns, this uh, Hilmi and Liat, they are more citizens of the conflict than they are citizens of their own nations. So uh, they, their, their whole life is designed under the shadow of the occupation, the shadow of the ongoing conflict, and they have this conflict to be part of their mental landscape, this war zone going on that is in a way in a way it's it's they their approach towards it is being <coughs> carried in their gaze. Whatever I mean they have the conflict within them. They're not uh, they're not absolutely sure about right and wrong. They're, they have the ambivalency even elaborated by their encounter coming together. They learn much more about the other and much more about themselves. I wrote this book as a portrait of my Israeliness. I never thought it's going to be ever suspected to be anti-Zionist. This is a, such a Zionist work of art. I mean, I'm a product of Zionism. I owe so much to Zionism unless this decision of my family to immigrate from Iran to Israel, I would have been brought up in Tehran and I would have been deprived of so many rights, of so many freedoms, of so many of elements of my identities that I cannot imagine myself without. So being brought, born in Israel, being brought up in Israel, I, I owe Israel so much that, that, I, I, um, that I will, that I will, I, 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 I've been reminded of, of the attacks I had to suffer because of this book, because of, of being blamed of anti-patriotism. Nowadays, Israel considers patriotism to turn your back or to, to, to go against your neighbor's narrative. This is the way to prove how loyal you are to your own tribe. Not being able to, to accept two narratives as an option. This is our main issue. This is the core of the problem. Because Lid, Lida, and Lud, Lod, these are names of the same place. And the histories should be acknowledged for having a dual narrative. Th there is one history, but there are two narratives. You, you cannot deny it. And this is what this book suggests the acknowledgement of the other, carry the other uh, perspective, the perception of the other as, as, as equal to you, as worthy as you, as, as, as human as you, sometimes even more relatable and more lovable than your brother. So it's, it's, uh, it's this is uh, the, fact, the fact that our all he existence as Israeli is nationalized by those nationalists who are taken hostage of what we call Israel, of what it, it's the portrait of our life. It's, 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 I, 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 I go furious when, when I'm, 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 being, I, I'm being reminded of all those accusations I had to suffer from the Minister of Education himself who had twisted fragments of my book on the eight o'clock news in front of all nation and blamed me as being the, 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 the enemy of the nation just by humanizing the other, just by redeeming the other from this suffocating sack of generalization that is being done by the government in the past two decades ever since the assassination of Rabin. Israeli democracy 
is being shaped by this sorceress and his apprentices, Mr. Netanyahu and all these Bennett, Regev, all these stupid apprentices who follow him and his dem demagogue re rhetoric. And you know, your president, I, I think he was an apprentice of his as well. Because you know, he, he had internalized so many of his methods and... and <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I, 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 I was uh, committing to myself not to interfere with your inner issues without knowing enough. But sometimes I hear, I hear him speak and I say, I know it from somebody. I heard it all el el earlier from someone. And they have the same sponsor, as you well know. The one responsible to brainwash Israelis' minds is, uh, is an American billionaire, uh, Sheldon Edelson. And he, he is, he is uh, nurturing uh, Bibi's regime, uh, Netanyahu's regime, in, in uh, let's say, the past decade by, by handing out for free what it appears to be a newspaper. Mm -hmm. I always say to my mom when I see her enjoying it so much, I tell her, this is not a newspaper. This is not a journal. It looks like a journal. It may be smell like a journal. Pictures and, and lettering, but it's not a journal. It's a fax from this government chamber. It's so, it's so obvious. But let me go back to this uh, uh, suffocating sack of the generalization that this book suggests the opposite. It suggests the particular. It suggests to unblind uh, my characters from all the demons they were taught up, uh, brought up to, to, to know, to, to, to consider the other to be. And this is, um, I think, the, 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 the success and the embrace I got from the Israelis who read it and were, as I mentioned, it was published first at the beginning, right at the beginning of the Gaza war. It was, was a reason for me to just like, oi vey. <laughs> I mean, I just published a new book after 15 years of silence, and now I have a, a, this a dialogue option, this intimacy to f reflect our intimate life between the river and the sea and this ethnic symbiosis. And all of a sudden, a war just right now? Couldn't you just wait for the next season? It's a seasonal thing. But then came those phone calls I received from Israelis who were in shelters reading my book, those who were reading in between one siren and another, calling me and thanking me with tears, those ladies from south of Israel who were having sirens waking, up of, waking them up in the middle of the night and with their difficulty of falling asleep again, they would read about this sweetness created between Hilmi and Liat, between the Palestinian and the Israelis. And, and, and you know what else, the, the, the maybe the, the most ultimate reaction I got from Israelis were the soldiers, the soldiers that were going into Gaza to serve their military service as uh, the reserved army. I, I saw some pictures of those soldiers taking the book in their hand and the, the gun in the other hand and saying, I carry this book to Gaza and I read it in between shifts because I want to be reminded that I'm not fighting against all Gazans. It's us good guys against bad guys. And I'm fighting for Gazans themselves, the good guys here as well. And I was so, so uh, astonished. What can literature can ask more than have this reward given from reality? I, I, uh, I, I, of course, those who took the pictures, I could connect them, I could thank them, I could uh, um, congratulate them for, for them being to elevate above the situation. It was an, an enormous act of morality to read literature in, in the war going on when you serve in the army, and above all, a, a one that, that, that can be conflictual. That, that, it's, uh, that it's ambivalent with its morality. Um, um, well, I'm sorry I, I, that I carry, I'm carried away. It's, it's just that uh, I... Um, no, it's, it's wonderful, Dori. Thank you. Uh, I, and now I know for sure you're Israeli. Uh, <laughs> no doubt about that. Um, and let, I, let, let I me... Wanna, sorry, yeah. sorry. I, we, we, I, have, I, I have a friend, an American friend, that she... That she uh, 
Khilmi in the book is based on a true character. Of, uh, the character is based on a true person I met when I was living here in 2002. And he was used to going nuts about, because us, we, we, we speak into each other's speech, you know? We, we don't let the other finish his, his sentence and we just like, crisscross, everything is like, ah! And then she would take, as an American, such a long poses <laughs> within her sentences until she found the most accurate adjective to come up. And then she would wonder, and he would like, mm! <laughs> Just, just to, to uh, emphasize what you were saying about the differences of cultures. Right. Um, so uh, I have many, many more questions. I wanted to read from the book and highlighted it and posted it. But uh, we're running out of time, and I want to make sure that people here get a chance to uh, ask questions. So, you know, I'll open it up. What was the book uh, coming? Uh, where where the book was coming from? From reality, where it was imported from into literature. Is this a why did you write it? I wrote it in order to carry the memory of Hassan Khourani, to whom the book is dedicated to, a Palestinian artist I met here, uh, <laughs> very close to here, in, uh, in 14th Street and, and, and 6th Avenue. Uh, we had a mutual friend. Our encounter was very passionate. We're passionate. Um, and it was uh, a very much of the beginning of me getting uh, uh, to know a, a large group of Palestinians in Brooklyn, scholars, artists, intellectuals. And through them, for the very first time, I, I was experiencing my Israeliness in, in its con contrast, but at the same time with its most fundamental similarities that I was sharing with them, I was sharing with Hassan. And for his memory, I wrote the book. I addressed my writing to him. I was in actually conversing with him. He also had his remarks about my writing. He was saying, um, Dorit, I'm an Arab man. Don't you forget, you're making this helmet too feminine. Yeah. He's too sensitive. He's crying a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, he, he was a very sensitive and <laughs> very uh, um, vulnerable person as well. So I wasn't making it up from nothing. But, m but describing him, telling about him with my Hebrew, that was my revolt. Bringing him back to life with my Hebrew, because he lost his life very much like him. If you read the book, you would uh, figure out what I'm saying now. Sending out my hand both hands and reaching out to pull him back and to give him new life, literary life, flesh and blood as much as literature can give, was, uh, was a way to, to rescue not only, his, um, not only his memory, not only his, his art, because he was a very talented person and he was in the midst of his breakthrough. So the time I knew him made me the witness of his last month of his life. So I, I felt I was nominated to be his narrator, to tell about him. And, and this, this ally, this bond that we were experiencing in this background of alienation from this cold, from this winter, from this being away from home was, uh, was so significant for me. And I, I believe this, this seed, this flame of truth is the one you need to import to your writing to make it uh, believable first for yourself as a first reader. It makes you go on with this struggle of writing, of making something out of nothing. So he was my inspiration. He was my muse. I sometimes think that if it was otherwise, I was the heroine of his novel. He would have written about me if it was going uh, other way. Because we had, we had this uh, something that goes beyond a man and a woman. We had a true friendship that was so valuable because of the, the correspondence with life and death back at home. 
it was a good reason to write a novel. <laughs> so how, how come this, this book, among those two other novels, that one of them was published in the 70s and the other one in the 80s, both taking place in Haifa, a mixed city that Jews, Jews and Arabs live in neighbor and, and very much in, in, in could be, could, could be a mofet, how would I say? A model, a model for and an, an potential hope, hoping to be coexistence of Jews, Jews and Arabs living um, in peace. I think the scandal reflects more of Israel today, Israel 2000, 16, 17, more than it reflects my work. It's not provocative. Its merits are for its subtlety. If you read it and thoroughly, I, I, I acknowledge it to be a generous gift given from you. You could have seen that it's, uh, it's them, it's not me. The fact that they rejected the book and the arguments that they were stating were actually for it to be very current, very relevant, very strong. And this is why they don't want young readers to be exposed to this kind of story, because it might encourage to assimilation. That exactly was the quote from the report. It was, it was, um, it was a committee that was very much wanting to please his, their master. The master is a religious right-wing propaganda demagogue. I stop here with the adjectives because I, I go rude. <laughs> so I, I, guess, I guess I cannot be credited for the scandal because this, I have nothing to do with it. The question is, how is the book received in the Arab world? Thank you for your question. It's, a, it's an interesting one because it's about to be, trans I mean, the translation is in process. My translator I called him before I came to the US in mid-April. I told him, listen, Abed, people are waiting for the Arabic translation to be finished. Come on, go, go, go more fast. Because he, because he's taking his time doing a good job, translating it well. Um, so it hasn't yet been done. And, and since that, that not yet been published in the Arab world in Arabic. But I must say that I have a numerous reaction coming from Hebrew reading Palestinians. And those are the ones I cherish in a special case in my heart. Because, because uh, for them to reassure me that Hilmi is an accurate or authentic young Arab of this generation, that his movements in this story are um, not only a, a, a mirror to, to the way I could have seen Hassan, I can <coughs> stow his friends, but also they see a reflection of themselves in Hilmi. And they, they, they uh, appreciate what I did to this character of, being, of having him to be, you know, so, so I mean, it's not that he's, He's not glorified. He's, he, he can be annoying. He can be, he's like Liat. He has his weak points. He has his, uh, but, but, he, but he's, um, he, he arouses uh, 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 sentiments. Those who are telling me, and I cannot, it's like too much. They're saying, I, I don't want to reveal the ending. OK. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> I'm giving like, <laughs> but, but he, 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 uh, he does, uh, he does evoke identification and to go back to the scandal, I think this was the main fault of my book. It might not encourage assimilation, it might, it might encourage identification. This government, and you can pass it on, <laughs> if we, <laughs> Our prime minister had radicalized empathy to that extent that even feeling for the other, even, even considering the other to be worth being sorry for, is considered nowadays in Israel to be a radical action. It's an unbearable thought. I can see you're frozen. <laughs> Empathy, it's our cure. This is the only way you can, we can, I mean, get, 
get, get free out of this complex, out of this conflict, our possibility to, 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 to know the other from within and to, and to acknowledge him as us. And uh, you know, there was, there was one night, there was one night that Hassan uh, 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 was very stoned and he was coming up with a solution to the conflict in the Middle East. So his stony idea was that there will be a civil service, both in the Palestinian territories and, the Israel, and in Israel, a civil service that you have to be engaged by the government with somebody in the other side and to be responsible for him. There's one in each side, there are pairs like this, that maybe families, maybe people who care, who give a call saying, how are you? Are you okay? How are your children? How's your health? Chag Sameach, Happy Eid, to go with this uh, empathy as, and I was adding, there should be a tax deduction <laughs> for empathy. <laughs> that would <can> be, <laughs> yeah, you could see, maybe this is a, this is a, a non-solution for now. Please. Since it is fiction, I assume, I want to assume it is a fiction. Did you have any thought of trying to deal with them being together, ending up being together, somewhere between <laughs> Palestine and Israel? I, I, I would, I would, uh, I, would um, I, I respect this question. I want to answer it. This book was written uh, for Hassan. It was, it was important for me to have, to come to this uh, mm, peak of the theme I was developing in the book, the theme of mixture, the fear of mixture, this uh, concept of, uh, uh, of uh, intimacy, harmony, peaceful, peacefulness can be also a threat to your identity. The fear of peacemaking as much as lovemaking to be a threat to your identity, being colored, being washed, being subsumed, being devoured. I'm going to the, like, the extreme. Those fears are, sh they should be acknowledged. I mean, I think that many of the reality we see nowadays is the neglection of the liberal thinking of our tribal instincts, of our, our anxiety. And among other things, this book suggests an option to acknowledge the other's anxiety, the other's very much your own tribal instinct, very much your own. This is, you know, I've been, I've been traveling since from one campus to another, and I have, I have young Jewish students approaching me and really, really asking me in thirst to equip them with answers to how to defend Israel, how to stand by Israel, how to respond to those who attack Israel. And the only thing I can offer is the only thing I told about and I carry with me is the entitlement to be ambivalent, the entitlement to carry both narratives, both justice. Because in the Middle East, justice is the most elusive, cunning thing. Morning time, we're the good guys. Afternoon, bad guys. The day after, we shift. It's, 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 it's non-stable. You shouldn't have, I mean, in Israel, we're allowed for our opinion to be liquid. You don't have to be solid in your position. Here in America, when, when, when young Jews are being at attacked for the Israeli state or the Israeli government, I can see that they're shaking before because of their authentic instinct is to be, is to, is, is to be able to, to, to stand from this side of Israel to that side of Israel. Still, it's always around Israel, but you, you shouldn't stick to one position. Of, uh, being a patriot is, doesn't mean to be stubborn, doesn't mean to be, to be uh, how do you, uh, uh, explanation, uh, how, it's okay to have some question marks in your arsenal, it's okay. It's not that uh, of a, it's, it's the conflict. You're not in, in a war time when, you're, when, you, when, when Israel's uh, morality is being questioned. It's okay. Our morality is, basis, is based enough as much as the, 
uh, our democracy, and, and I think the whole debate around this book proves of how our liberal roots are, 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 are deep. Even this, this, this torment that, democracy, that our democracy goes through just proves of how much the structure of our way of life is stable. Just by shaking it, it it's, it's, it's proven to be, to be um, not immune, but strong enough to, to face those shakes. Uh, I, I will conclude your point about Middle Eastern Jews, Mizrahi, Oriental Jews, and uh, uh, Europe, European Jews, Euro European Oriented Jews. Um, my book opens, the first chapter is an interrogation <coughs> that Liad the Israeli experienced by the FBI. It's 9-11, post 9-11 days, and posters in the subway invites citizens to call to the police if they see something suspicious. She finds herself being uh, taken as uh, an Arab-looking girl. Her, the Israeli. She's a Mizrahi. She's from the neighborhood. She's from the Middle East. And this um, experience of her as a beginning, as a note of, to open her identity being investigated, not only in front of the authorities, but actually the whole novel is the investigation of, of her Israeli identity, her oriental oriented identity being um, raised in Israel. It's a bond to open, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a link, it's the opening note of the bond between her certain kind of Jewishness to Hilmi's Arabness. It's, a, it's, an, it's the hyphenate uh, uh, encounter. I, 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 sh I, I surf from this chapter to their uh, first meeting, and I, in a way, make their, their uh, love from the first sight have also those uh, mental, maybe geographical echoes to serve as something about the skin color, something about the 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 the, 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 the music of the of the speak, the the speech. Yeah. Uh, the <laughs> all those uh, <laughs> funny funny noises that we make from our throat. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> yeah, I think it's a good way to, 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 to put your hand, your finger on this subject of their identities uh, uh, not coming together and this beginning of the duet of the Arabness and the Jewishness, the Israeliness, the Palestinianness, the whole, whole Middle Easternness uh, of the two uh, nationhoods being eliminated from the equation. Now they have those particular individuals who are uh, exploring not only one another, but each one his own self through the other. Thank you so much for listening. You were so much into me. <laughs> you were so attentive. I'm so grateful. I couldn't be more grateful. Thank you so much. would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.